Please consider becoming a patron of Myth Vision Podcast. You'll get early access to every video, including this amazing one. And you can ask me personal questions, private message me, anything you'd like. Professor Elaine Pagels, I've got a question. Irenaeus, the church father, said that the four Gospels were written by the disciples, or if you will, followers of Jesus. Right. We now have really good reason not to believe such claims. Does this open up a door for Gnostic Gospels to potentially carry more weight? Irenaeus was a leader of the church in Lyons in France. And he was very much troubled by the fact that different Christians in his group were reading different gospels. He says, look, some people are reading only one gospel. They're reading only Luke. In other parts of the world, they're reading only Matthew. Some are reading John. Some are reading the Gospel of Thomas. And then there are these heretics and they say they have more gospels than there really are. I'm quoting him. He said, but really, they have no gospel that isn't full of blasphemy. So he was aware that, that there was a lot of differentiation between different groups because they were reading different sources and getting very different ideas. So he said, look, we've got to, we've got to consolidate here. How do we do it? Well, there are four gospels that he believed were written by disciples of Jesus. And he was probably told that in the second century by his mentor, um, Bishop Polycarp in Syria. Uh, that was He was the spiritual father of Irenaeus, sent Irenaeus to be a missionary among the barbarian people who lived in what is now France. It spoke some weird barbarian language that wasn't Greek. So Irenaeus said, look, there really can be only four Gospels. Um, and if you ask him why, he said, well, it's kind of a scientific explanation. There's four corners of the universe, and there are four principal winds, right? This is Greek cosmology. And so there can be only four Gospels. Um, it's, it's just natural that there's only four Gospels. Right. And, and so he insisted that, that this was the God-given quaternity of Gospels. He called it the four-form Gospel. He said, well, it's really one Gospel, because when he talked about a Gospel, he meant, he meant the preached message. And he said the message is supported by four pillars. The four pillars are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they, they give you different aspects of Jesus. So he said Matthew, he talks about the physical genealogy of Jesus the Messiah in the Davidic line, the King of Israel. Um, Mark, he talks about Jesus as a prophet. Uh, Luke, he talks about Jesus as a physician and a priest. Okay, of sort of a healer of souls. And John talks about Jesus in the highest possible way as God in human form. So really, he said, you need them all, and they all agree with one another, and these are the only Gospels you can use. Now, he said, look, there are people who say Jesus had secret teaching. He doesn't say, Mark says that in chapter 4. He says, there are people who say Jesus had secret teaching, but that's not true. He contradicts what is said in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. He contradicts Paul when Paul says he has secret teaching in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 and 7. and says, no, there's no valid secret teaching at all. Paul didn't do it. Jesus didn't do it. Forget that. God forbid there's a teaching you don't know. <laughs> Well, we don't, we don't accept them because if it's a secret teaching, you might have written it. Um, how do we know that Jesus said that? Well, so he, he chooses a very definitive conservative position, which excludes any other source as authoritative as a gospel than the four in the New Testament. And he didn't have the power to enforce that conviction. That was his desire to say, the heretics are wrong. They say there are other Gospels. Just forget that. But after Constantine 
became the first Christian emperor. And Christians were now favorites of the empire. And they, they received, the Christian bishops were no longer persecuted and, and torn to death in the, in the arenas and, and put on trial and tortured because they were Christians. Now they were powerful friends of the emperor. Now they could, the bishop of, of Egypt, for example, could become the most, the richest man in the whole city because he had the con control of the grain supply. He had given, he received political power and financial power from the em emperor. And now there was political power and in, in, there was actually military power to back up the claims of those who call themselves Orthodox. So the followers of Irenaeus, bishop like um, um, oh, Athanasius in, in Egypt, Catholic bishop, f followed Irenaeus, said, okay, now we can implement those four Gospels. We can make it effectively church law that there are only four Gospels. We will write the creed, the Nicene Creed. We will put this all into a very organized form, and we will have the first Orthodox Catholic communion based on three things, the, the creed, statement of what we believe, written out by a committee, the Nicene Creed, we'll have a canon, these books, no other books, and we'll have the clergy, and they will have to be Catholics. They'll have to be part of our group who agree to those, the shape of this Orthodox Catholic Church. I'm really glad you elaborated all that because everything you just said kind of comes back full circle to once we know the reasoning behind I'm, <clears throat> look I get it four winds four corners of the earth etc cetera, etc cetera. but now with the the way we understand things and look at it trying to look behind what is he really trying to do I think we can see through some of this and we can go okay these gospels that he meshes together they supposedly all go together perfectly it makes sense as to why a diatessaron was, was taken to writ. You know what I mean? Why someone wanted to do that. Yes, and he also said something very important. He said, look, you want to be a Christian? Okay, you can join our church. What you have to do is you go, have to go through a catechism. We'll teach you what the true teaching is. And then you'll come to be baptized. We'll wash away your sins, put you under the water, right? And then you will, you will recite the creed. And you will say, we believe in God, creator of all things. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the resurrection from the dead, uh, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, the judgment, the life to come, and so forth. We will, you will say the creed. And once you have done that, you have to stop there. You have to say, that's what I believe, and that's where I stand. He said, but there are people among us who say, okay, We've been baptized. We've said the creed. We're believers. But we also include these other advanced teachings. And now that you're part of the church and you've become established as a Christian, you've started to practice, maybe you've been a Christian for 10 years. Now, now, now consider other ways of interpreting this. Consider some other questions. What do we really mean by God? What do we really mean by resurrection? What do we really mean by virgin birth? In, come to our group and, and we'll open up a deeper level of understanding. Irenaeus says, don't believe those people. They're going to try to initiate you again into a second level of initiation. You don't need that. Baptism is all. Stay there with that creed. Don't go anywhere else, just like Tertullian. You, once you have the truth, just stick to that, nothing else. I guess where I'm going in at, at this because I see what what he's doing here, and they're making it an organized. Exactly, they're organizing an institution, organization. But when his foundations for why the four gospels and why this and why that, like divorcing the whole political scene and why this makes sense, why he would do this, doesn't it open up the door to say, okay? He is not accepting these other ideas because they really kind of flow against what he's trying to accomplish. And oftentimes they're teaching things contrary to the things he finds acceptable. For example, we look at the Gospels, we know there's problems. We know there's problems between them. 
maybe this is why a diatessaron is being written. Uh, would you think that that would be why they wrote it, is to try and harmonize yes. the problems? Yes. I mean, if if you accept those four Gospels, then why not just put them and write them together into one? I, it didn't work that way. Right. I think because the narrative of Mark is so vivid and powerful. John's Gospel is also powerful in its way, and so is Matthew and Luke's. So the diatessaron is kind of a mess. You know, it's all smooshed together, and it just didn't, read well. It didn't, makes you wonder what didn't they preach at. you well. Right. But and there's another reason Irenaeus was very much concerned, as you said, Derek, to create an institutional church and define it. And that is that his life was at stake. Christians in the time he was living in 160 were being rounded up and arrested, accused of being Christians. If they said they were, they were being tortured to death and condemned to, be, to go into the sports arena and die in public torture. Mm. There were probably 22 members of his own churches, people who refused to deny that they were Christians, who were publicly tortured and executed to entertain the crowd on the emperor's birthday. Because ordinarily, when you... When you're a governor of a province and you're supposed to supply the entertainment, you have to go pay for gladiators, trained athletes. You have to get sword fighters. You have to get strange animals. You have to get um, people who, uh, gladiators who will have a battle to the death in the arena. This is how you entertain the public, right? But at the time that Irenaeus was living, there was inflation. The governors were having a hard time getting enough taxes. So they appealed to Marcus Aurelius, sent him a petition, and they said, look, it's very expensive to get gladiators and athletes to populate the circuses on, on your birthday to celebrate for the population. Do you mind if we use condemned criminals? Because that's a lot cheaper, and and it's pretty entertaining. You know, we can set animals on them and they could be torn apart by wild animals and it's it's good it's exciting and emperor marcus really said yes that's all right you can use condemned criminals it was at that point that christians were hounded arrested tortured are you a christian or not and if you didn't give up under torture you were sent to to wait in prison for the day of the emperor's birthday when you would die in public entertainment. So that was the kind of danger he was under. And Irenaeus was not just power hungry. He wanted the churches to survive. And he felt like the American revolutionaries, you know, when they, they said, when they were signing the Declaration of Independence, if we don't all hang together, it's sure that we will all hang separately. And so he wanted his group to inform Christians in Rome that our people are being tortured here, and they're part of the same group as you. And we want you to understand that. And he wanted to unify churches all over the known world. And to do that, they needed an organizational structure. So that's another important part of the story. It was, it was persecution that sort of pressured leaders like Irenaeus to try to create a structure that would define who was in and who was out. Wow. So much to say. So much, yeah. Yeah, it's more to the story. Yeah, looking at it from each side kind of makes you sympathize, too. So. Well, yeah, it's, it, it is a story about persecution. Very much so. In fact, when Irenaeus himself, he was not arrested. He was sent to Rome by the, by the people who confessed that they were Christians and who were scheduled to die in the arena. They sent him to Rome to tell people what was happening. And when he went to Rome, he said he had a vision of his own teacher being burned alive in the public stadium uh, back in Syria. And that had happened. His, his own teacher in his 80s, respected teacher uh, of Christianity, called the teacher of Asia, was condemned as a Christian, uh, 
because he, he refused to say he was not, and he was burned alive in a public stadium to entertain the crowds. And Irenaeus said he somehow felt it was happening at the time. And that shaped very much his view of, say, nonconformists. He wanted to get people inside the fold. And the Gnostics, being nonconformist, anti-authoritarian, in a sense, they didn't, they didn't, they fought against that. And so he had a good axe to grind when it came to these people. Simultaneously, it seems like Revelation, which we're going to get into some of these questions that you, you wrote on the book, but this fits exactly into why he applied it to himself and became kind of a heretic with this literature. Well, I have questions about the book of Revelation that we'll get to, but the point I'm making, I guess, is important. And in light of the constant still persecution done by the Romans uh, that is still happening during his own time, this in, book was still a thumbs up in guys like him. But then eventually, next thing you know, they're in power and Rome's got, Rome stops all that nonsense and it didn't quite end the way they expected it yes, would. Yes, that's right. So it's a fascinating history. That's right. But, but when we think about the early Christian movement, it is a fact that, that persecution wasn't everywhere at once. It wasn't massive and worldwide. It couldn't be. The world we're talking about went from Iran to Egypt to Africa to Spain to France to Belgium to what is now Britain. It, it was, they called it the whole world, right? right? The whole world as Rome knew it. You can't govern that. So persecution would break out when this governor got serious about getting rid of those people or that governor wanted to show that he was tough. <sighs> or the emperor would make some statement like, get after those Christians. So it was sporadic. And some people, some scholars even, or people who claim to be scholars, think it was kind of a sham persecution, and that it was a myth they made up. One scholar, Candida Moss, says that. I think she's very wrong, because she says, well, it wasn't that many people who got killed. It, you know, there, it wasn't a massive empire-wide movement. And I want to say, no, it wasn't. But if you were, for example, to go to New Jersey, where Princeton is, and you go into certain parts of New Jersey and you address, you, you arrest a Muslim leader and another one, torture that person and kill him, everybody would know. Even in a world in which you don't have communications like now, you don't have to kill a lot of people to terrify everyone. And that's what persecution's about. You don't need to kill everybody. You need to scare them to death and tell them to don't say you're part of that movement anymore. Because that movement is probably involving insurrection against Rome. They're probably traitors. So we're trying to scare you into giving it up. Persecution was, was a, a tremendous threat. We know, after all, Peter was beheaded. No, Peter was... A star. Paul was whipped and beheaded by Roman order of the Roman governor. Peter was crucified. James was lynched to death in Jerusalem. So the, the best known leaders of the Christian groups in Jerusalem, Rome, and, uh, and all over were executed by the Roman Empire, and everybody knew that. That did scare them. Thank you. 